let's see if I can share my screen so we can talk a little bit more about Eco Explorer. There should be a green button directly in the middle, share screen. Oh, okay. I see it now. It was too go. obvious. It says I'm uh, the host has disabled the screen sharing. Give me one. Oh, it's working now. Okay. It's working. Okay. okay. Awesome. Can everybody see that? Okay, great. So, um, like I said, Eco Explore, we're the Northern Coastal Region Hub, and Eco Explore was a citizen science initiative started by the North Carolina Arboretum out in Asheville, North Carolina, and has since spread throughout the state. And um, now it is even spread all the way to north and northeastern North Carolina, where we are the Northern Coastal Region Hub. And um, the point of Eco Explore is to get you guys outside, taking pictures of wildlife you see in your backyard. Not only because that's cool and fun in its own right, but also because you can help real scientists with their research by doing this. So the basic three steps for Eco Explore is see it you snap it and then you share it. So this can be anywhere, whether you're a local park or you're in your backyard or just around your house. If you see something that is living, so it either can be a plant, animal, it doesn't matter. As long as it's a living creature, you see it, you take a picture of it and you share it on Eco Explore after you've created an account. And the ways you can earn points is just really basic. Just if you take a picture of any living thing, you get one point get two points if you're able to correctly or if the photo is good enough quality that somebody can identify that a scientist can see it and then the third point is if you're able to correctly identify it so if you see a bullfrog out in your yard you take a picture it's a clear picture and you're correctly identified as a bullfrog that's a third point and then your fourth and fifth points come if you take a picture in the field season and during a hot spot and right now luckily for everybody um, the entire state of North Carolina during this time is going to be considered a hot spot. Usually it's just your local state park or maybe your library, but for right now, that fourth point is pretty much free because the whole state of North Carolina is going to be a hot spot. And then the fifth point, like I talked about, is based on the field season. So the different field seasons are botany season in the spring and right now we're in the middle of herpetology season then after herpetology season comes entomology so insects and then in the winter we have ornithology season so we're taking pictures of birds then and even though these seasons are cover different areas it doesn't matter what you take a picture of even though we're technically in herpetology season you see a really cool flower or an awesome bug and you want to take a picture of it you can still upload the that observation it will still be very helpful to scientists you just earn a little bit extra points and you get closer to earning a badge if you take pictures of herps during herpetology season and we'll talk a little bit more about what herps are and um, Becky and Mercer will give you a good rundown of the different ones we have um, here in North Carolina that, that you might find. And then another incentive is if you take enough pictures, get enough points, you can trade those points in for all kinds of really cool outdoor prizes. So there's anything from like a nature journal to a plant press to singing stuffed birds, even an outdoor um, iPod touch, an eco bat meter, an underwater, a digital camera that you can take underwater. So there's all kinds of really cool prizes that you can earn as well as your badges while you're outdoors taking these pictures. And soon we'll be launching uh, library loan spots. So to help you go out and uh, maybe catch um, certain bugs or catch certain herbs or take better pictures, we're going to have um, pretty soon at Shepherd Proven, we're going to have a backpack 
that you can go and just like you would run out of a book, you could rent these, um, these packs and they'll help you take better pictures and just be even better as you go explore so you can get out earning more points and get to earning badges. So, and um, if anybody has any questions about Eco Explore, feel free to type them in the chat. I'll be happy to answer them. But now we are going to go over a little bit about herpetology and where you might find different herps. And Marissa, if you find anything, you can interrupt me anytime. I will do it. Okay. All right, are we able to see this? Let me know if somebody cannot see my PowerPoint right now that says herp habitat hunt. I do not see it yet, um, but you are still on share screen. Perfect. I think I said update the screen. Is that better? Yep, I see it. Awesome. So, like I said, we're in the middle of herpetology season and herps are anything that's a reptile or an amphibian. And these might be a little bit harder to spot than, let me say, insects or birds that you might see all around your house, but it's not always as hard as you think. So we're going to go over just a few while we're waiting on Marissa. We're going to go over a few of these different habitats that you might have around your home and talk about the kinds of herps you might find there and be able to photograph. If I can get it to transition. There we go. So right here is what's called a vernal pool. And vernal pools are great herb habitats because they are pools that exist in forests or anywhere, but they do not, they're like big puddles, but they're not quite ponds because they don't exist year round. So they'll dry up during really dry times, but when you get a lot of rain, they'll grow and get pretty big. And because of this, fish are not able to live there year round because fish require water every day of the year. They need it to breathe, they need it to survive but amphibians don't need it every day. They don't always have to be in water, but they do really like water. They like to lay their eggs in water. They like to stay moist. So some of the herbs you might find around a vernal pool is something like a spring peeper, or a, um, which is a type of frog that's really common in Eastern North Carolina. There's all kinds of different frogs you might find in vernal pools because they love to lay their eggs in there so that their tadpoles can grow and survive and don't have to worry about being eaten by fish, which really prefer tadpoles as one of their favorite snacks. Another um, amphibian you might find around vernal pools is here you can see the marbled salamander. Salamanders are another species that love vernal pools for the same reasons. They don't have to worry about predators and they're able to go in to these pools and hang out, stay nice and cool, stay nice and moist, and um, can avoid the hot sun, especially during the summertime. And moving away from amphibians, another um, herp that you might find in this area is um, a snake, smaller snakes, like the eastern garter snake, which is a very small snake that likes to hang out around rotted logs, and it will hunt in these areas and feed on small frogs and insects, crickets, all kinds of things like that. So be on the lookout if you're ever in the forest by your house or at a park and you see a vernal pool, it might help you to just sit still and just be very vigilant and keep an eye out for any of these herps and tons more. Next, we're going to move to what's hopefully another familiar habitat for you guys, and that's the pond at your local park. And if you're ever at the pond, I don't know if you guys will be able to hear this. And you hear something like that, you know you're listening to the American bullfrog. Bullfrogs really like to hang out around these areas and they can be very vocal, especially um, after a rain or around sunset or sunrise. If you hear that loud, just unmistakable grunt of the American bullfrog, you know it's nearby and you have a good chance of catching it. Another very common herb to find around here are turtles, specifically the yellow-bellied slider. Um, like all reptiles, turtles are cold-blooded, which means they cannot produce their own heat, so they need the warmth of the sun to warm their blood. So when it, they start to get cold, they need to lay up on a rock 
or on a log like you see this one right here and just bask in the sun and just let it warm their body. Another kind of turtle you might find that's maybe not quite as uh, cute or friendly as the yellow-bellied slider is the snapping turtle. Now snapping turtles will not hurt you as long as you keep your safe distance and you do not mess with them. They have a, um, his, they have a tendency to be um, short-tempered, but like I said, they will not hurt you. They're not going to go out of their way to hurt you. They are mostly just defensive. They don't want, they don't want to be bothered just like they won't bother you, but um, they can be found pretty commonly around ponds, especially in neighborhood areas. So if you see something that looks like maybe it's a log or a big rock, take a look, closer look and keep your hands and fingers away from its mouth and make sure you get a good picture of it because that is a snapping turtle. And last but not least, here we have um, a reptile, the five-lined skink. Skinks, just like the yellow-bellied slider, need that sun warmth for their blood. So they'll like to hang out around rocks. They don't really quite like the water mu as much as turtles do. In fact, not at all, but they'll hang out on the docks, on the pavement, around your house, or even at your local park. So be on the lookout for them because they are very common. Moving on next, we have the wetland boardwalk. So we're in a swampy area. Um, and we're taking a walk down maybe a, a state park and a very marshy area or your local park and there's all kinds of wildlife you can find in these areas but definitely a lot of reptiles and amphibians. One of the reptiles being one that a lot of people think of when they think of swamps and that is the American alligator. So North Carolina is the northernmost region of the American alligator and, but they can be very common in areas like this. So just be looking for those, those uh, scary looking eyes popping up out of the water. And um, sometimes you might think it's a log just floating by, but it well, is in fact an American alligator. They love to hang out in these areas um, and they'll sunbathe out on the shores where, and then in the waters is where they like to hunt mostly for fish. Another reptile. Hey, Ryan. Yeah, go ahead, Marissa. Can I pop in? Let me stop sharing. Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect timing. Go right ahead. All right, I found an amphibian. Let me see if All I can right. turn the camera. Um, bear with me, y'all. I'm learning how to use Zoom on my phone. <laughs> oh, can you see it clear, Ryan? Yeah, just hold it there steady, and it'll zoom in or it'll focus. Is it focusing? Still a little blurry for me, but it's getting there. Oh, yeah, that's a lot better. It could, it could be the condensation, too, because it is warm out this morning. But this guy is – actually, I need to look at him a little bit better. I'm thinking – so it's definitely – oh! <laughs> Hold on, he jumped away from me. Grab him. So it's definitely a frog. Oh, up the tree. Oh, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. I may have lost my little froggy friend. Hold hold on. Yeah, I think I have another friend that's hanging out one of these PVC poles. Let me see if he'll cooperate. These are the adventures of field work. You never really know what's gonna happen out there. Yes. Ooh, these guys are fast, let me tell you. They're a lot faster than some of the other ones I've been dealing with. Holy moly. Okay, okay. Okay, I got this one. Hold on. Okay. I'm gonna go in the light here. Maybe you guys can see a little bit better. I can find some light. It's a little dark back here, but. What do you guys think? Do you know this is a, um, what type of frog we would call this? Does anyone want to take a guess? You can maybe use its color to help you know what the name is. 
we have a Do guest. Um, yeah, we have a guest saying tree frog. Tree frog is correct. And you most probably most commonly see these guys, especially maybe around your house or um, just around your neighborhood. So we like tree frogs. Um, these guys, this is specifically a tree frog and he's kind of in his typical colors except for amphibians can vary in different colors so um, but they're more known for this coloration which is that green and then they have that that kind of that pale white stripe on their body and then it's Um, he's got gold specks on him. So um, these guys, the green tree frogs sometimes have gold specks on, on them as well. So this kind of gave me some pictures to determine that he is definitely a green tree frog. And again, we like these guys that eat insects. And I actually found these guys hang out what's called a PVC pole. So a lot of times different places and even you can in your backyard set up a PVC pole and you'll be amazed at how many tree frogs you might find in there because they like to hang out in there. During the day. Such a cool find. Hey, Marissa, hey Marissa, your connection is a little low, so it's um, you're disconnecting a little bit, but I'm going to share my screen again. Yeah, we can hear you. We just can't see anything. So I'm going to show them real quick a picture, um, a better picture of the green tree frog so everybody can get an idea of what you're holding. Okay, yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. I don't know why my service is going out, but. That's all right. You're out in the field, so we, <laughs> you're out in the woods, so we don't really, can't really rely on it too much. So um, I will hey, share my screen. Can you see me right now? Well, I'm sharing my screen now to show we can't we couldn't see anything for that moment. So I'm sharing my screen. So this is can everybody see the picture of the um, tree frog I have up? Ryan. Yeah. Ryan, can you I have a I have a little deer coming towards me. Oh, let me start Hold on. This is crazy. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Is your camera on? Because I don't think we can see anything. Can you are you, is, can you see anything on my video? No. No. Darn it. Maybe oh, try reconnecting. Okay. Um, I might try to leave and come back. It's a fawn. Um, it's yeah, a little try one. And, try and exit and come back and see if that works. And I'll show the picture of the um, green tree frog again. Yeah, i try to disconnect and come back because he's, he's like checking me out. That's so cool. <laughs> All right, I'll be back. All right, sounds good. All right, so like um, Marissa was saying, the green tree frog has this um, white stripe on the side of its mouth to about its belly, and it doesn't go all the way down. And then you also see those gold specks that we couldn't really see very well in the video because they're kind of hard to see even on a zoomed-in picture like this. But you can see those gold specks on its back, and that's how you're able to differentiate. Those are the main um, ways you're able to differentiate it from other tree frogs like the squirrel tree frog. You have anything to add, Becky? Did I miss anything? Oh, Becky's pulling out the snake. Hey, no, um, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, and the, the green tree frog is going to be about two inches in length. So if you think about maybe the length of your pointer finger might be a little smaller than that. And a squirrel tree frog is going to be about maybe an inch. So not not very much bigger. And the, like Ryan said, the green tree frog has that white stripe from his lips back to about his uh, waist, whereas a squirrel tree frog has a really faint or short line. Hey, Marissa, we can see you a little bit better now. Do you still see the fawn, Marissa? I wish I could have shared with you guys because I looked at it and was just like, hey, who are you? So you never know what you're going to see out in the woods, but I'll be back. <laughs> Hi, that sounds good. All right, so while Marissa is out in the field, hopefully her connection can get a little bit better. Sorry about that. But 
like we said, that's just the, uh, the risks you run when you're out in the field. So next, I'm going to pass it over to Becky, and she's got a few snakes she's going to show you guys and talk about. So if you have any questions about the snake she's handling, just go ahead and um, type them in the chat, and we can relay them to her. So she's going to start us off with a corn snake. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Can y'all hear me okay? Okay, cool. So I do have a handful of snakes literally to show you today. Um, and one snake in particular, I'm going to have to wash my hands before handling and I'll explain that at the very end. But um, this snake I have right here is called a corn snake. And it's very beautiful, as you can see with its patterning. Some of them are actually a really bright kind of um, almost scarlet or red. Some of them have really stunning oranges to them. And you can see he's sniffing around right there, <laughs> flicking his tongue, trying to, his forked tongue, trying to get a sense of, of what's around him. He's able to flick the sense of smell back to his Jacobson's organ. And um, that's how he processes his environment. He has decent eyesight, but smell is his best sense. Um, this is actually a female. Um, and you can see on her belly, you see how it looks like she has this checkerboard pattern, the white and black uh, checks there. Um, this is <clears throat> one of the reasons people think that they're called corn snakes is because they think that this looks like um, maize, uh, another name for a different type of corn. Um, and, you know, they hang around corn stalks and farm areas, but they don't eat corn. What do you think they eat? What, what would eat corn? So if you guessed mice and rats, you're right. And sometimes they'll eat lizards. Uh, sometimes you'll see them going after uh, bird eggs or young baby birds. So, um, you know, this is, this is an animal that hangs out where his food is gonna be. Corn snakes are so calm. As you can see this one, just they're really easy to have as a pet. Um, they have eyes that are just kind of these little circular blank eyes, so not the cat-like eyes like we think about with snakes that bite with fangs and venom, right? But um, corn snakes also have really smooth scales, so as I touch it, it's just very slick. It's almost like when you get a, um, a scar for a fabric or a baby blanket and it just feels so smooth you want to keep petting it. Um, so they have smooth scales on them. And uh, this one right here, she is, I think, at least four years old. But really, they only, they're about three feet in length. Excuse and um, don't get as big as six That's feet okay. long. Uh, we, had a, we had a question. How do you know the snake is a girl? Okay, so that's a little more intrusive. So snakes have... Um, I'm going to see with her, it'd be easiest to show. They have a special scale um, called a cloaca, okay? And so I'm going to see if I can't zoom in. You see the pattern in of all the scales? And then you see this one thick one right underneath my pointer finger? Okay, that one is the cloaca. That's the hole where snakes pee, poop, and reproduce from. So what we have to do to tell if a snake is male or female is we actually have to stick a probe into that cloaca and how many scales in it goes um, determines if it's a male or a female. Um, I believe if it's a female, it doesn't go in as deep as it does if it's a male. So uh, a snake, all their private parts are on the inside. And so that's how we're able to tell. Um, corn snakes, you can find them uh, pretty much throughout the whole state of North Carolina, except for the very northern parts up bordering up near Virginia. And they are what we call a constrictor. And so constrictors, what they do is they basically squeeze their food until they run out of oxygen. So think about like when you go and you give somebody a big hug, right? And they squeeze the air out of you and then you try to take a deep breath and then they squeeze tighter and then you can't fill up your lungs as much. Well, that's what this does and that's how it kills its prey. So they're constrictors. You can find them um, underneath bark and trees, under logs, um, around old fields, but they are typically more active at night. So it's not to say you won't see a corn snake out in the day, but typically they're out more at night. And that's because rats and other foods that they like are out at night too. So um, any questions about the corn snake before I put him back? I will say that this is one that gets mistaken for the venomous copperhead. 
um, because of the patterning, that banding is what we call these spots here, but it is not a comprehensive model. This is totally harmless, non-venomous, just eating snakes and earth eating rats and lizards and things like that, but they have beautiful colors. Okay, I'm going to grab another snake out really quick to show you, okay? Put this one back. Now this snake right here is probably uh, a, it's a baby and it's from last year's hatching. Okay, I actually caught this going out road cruising. So this is a wild snake. This is not one that's been kept as a pet. And this is a banded water snake. And whoo, he's stinky. So snakes do something called musk. And it's like a, a wet, smelly fart, honestly, that they put out so that you don't eat them. Um, there's not really a better way to say that. Sorry, parents. But banded water snakes, um, they do live in an environment where they can slip into the water easily to be hidden. And if you look at his pattern, um, he's got a really gorgeous pattern, but notice how dark he is. And if you're going in and out of the water on banks, this is really going to help you blend in with a lot of that wet plant matter that's there. Oh, he's, he's going on my keyboard. <laughs> but um, so he's, um, he's not happy right now. And you can kind of see how he's expressing through that cloaca right there. So he's not happy with me, but look at the belly. Really pretty belly kind of uh, random patterning there but this banding is a reason why he gets confused for the venomous cotton mouth um or you might also hear about um water moccasins it's the same thing but this is different this is a non-venomous water snake and like i said he probably hatched last year so he's about a year old um and these are totally harmless so they are most water snakes are heavy bodied and that's so that when they slip into the water they can actually swim down to the depths and I don't know, see how you can see that drip coming from him? That's him expressing himself, aka musking. Um, he's not is supremely happy, but um, they're usually heavy bodied so that they can go down to the bottoms of the water. Uh, they can catch crayfish to eat. They like smaller fish, um, salamanders, they'll eat tadpoles, fish, frogs. Um, so, you know, they usually will hang out around tree roots and stuff on the banks. Um, so water snakes uh, have also been seen sunning themselves on little limbs that overhang the waterways and they're found in fresh water, don't like salt. Um, and another distinct difference is besides the eyes, which sometimes we don't want you getting that close unless you know like they have the little black eyes. Um, the water moccasins or also known as the cotton mouth, they actually inflate themselves with air and kind of float on top of the water. Most uh, snakes, if they're non-venomous water snakes, they'll just drop into the water and sink to the bottom. But again, you know, if you're never sure, just don't get too close. But this is a banded water snake. Um, he gets to be about almost three feet long, but they can get as large as five feet. I'm trying to hold him still, see that gorgeous patterning there. Hey, Marissa. Um, yeah. Not Marissa, Becky, I'm yeah. sorry. Um, is he a constrictor as well? Um, so they actually, they just like to catch it and swallow it whole. So they're kind of more of, a, of an ambush uh, predator. And a lot of that is because they're literally catching their prey either on the fly or on the jump. So, um, you know, honestly, a really good time to see snakes if you have some back roads or some areas around you that are near water um, and you want to see some snakes in the summertime. Usually I start looking around 7.30 or 8.00. But once you start seeing frogs and toads cross the road, not very long after that, you're going to see snakes because they're going to be chasing them, looking for the frogs to catch them to eat them. So um, like most water snakes, the females are going to grow larger than the males and they'll give birth to any, anywhere between nine to 57 young in the summer and early fall. And if you haven't seen what a snake egg looks like, they're just kind of these little oblong um, leathery kind of casings. So they don't look like a sea turtle egg at all. Um, and you can kind of see where something is hatched out and this is dried out a little bit. So if you start to see little eggs like this, you may have snakes um, or you may have turtles hatching. We've got a lot of stuff hatching right now. So definitely be on the lookout for that. But um, 
These are really found along the coastal plains uh, from the very northern part down to the to the most southern parts here, but you can also find them around lakes, um, rivers, or streams, but they don't tend to be more in the mountain region. They tend to be where it's warmer, and that's because, you know, it's just of the habitats and all the plant matter that they can hide in. But this is a little guy, and like I said, he'll get to be about three feet, maybe if he's doing great, upwards of five feet. So this is, woo, you can see he's, he's active, a banded water snake here. And I'm gonna put him back, and woo, he's stinky. He went all over my keyboard. <laughs> My IT guy's gonna love that. But guess what? That's one way he keeps from being eaten. Okay. It's definitely an effective method. I don't know if I would want to eat something that was just constantly spraying out wet farts. It's kind of gross. I think I would definitely definitely turn the other way and look for a different snack. Now this next snake that I have. <clears throat> he looks a bit like a pretzel right now, I know. But this is a rat snake, okay? And these are so common. Um, and you're gonna see him, he's gonna look like he's gonna, he's very um, curious. So he's gonna look like he's, you know, raring up to strike me in the face, but he's just kind of like, what's happening? Um, they have okay senses of, uh, or with eyesight and touch, you know, they have these scales, but you know, really it's that sense of smell. So a rat snake, this is a very common snake. It's found throughout the state of North Carolina. They can, if you ever hear about somebody catching a big snake and they think it's a rattlesnake, um, you know, some rattlesnakes get large, but rat snakes, they'll usually get, they can get up to eight feet long. So their average length is about five feet. So these are very long. Now these are extremely strong constrictors and you'll notice see how he's pretzeling himself. Um, and I'm going to kind of be the tree and put him over my shoulders here um, and just kind of move my hands because that's one fun thing about picking up a snake is once you have it, he just assumes your hands are the structure that he's on. So we say, be the tree. Um, but again, be very cautious when handling snakes because anything with a mouth can bite. But the rat snake, we have actually two different types of color patterns. So um, in the mountains, in the Piedmont area, they're like a solid black. So if you ever hear anybody talk about a black snake, um, they're probably talking about a rat snake. We also have a black racer, but that looks um, different. It has really large eyes and it moves much quicker. And then in the coast, we have this kind of yellowish variety and it's got like the black stripe that runs down. And then if you can see this kind of pattern, this banding on the, on the, on the spine there, um, I'll show you a baby version of this that really shows that pattern. And underneath, kind of clearish looking, um, not really remarkable underneath, but um, these guys are excellent tree climbers. So he's extremely strong. A snake is one solid uh, piece of muscle. And he's got all of this is just ribs and a spinal cord that runs down the back here. And so he can actually scale a tree really quickly. And oftentimes you'll see them up in trees hanging out on the branches because um, they're going after birds or bird eggs. Um, they're also looking for, they're going to cavities so they can go after like little flying squirrels and all kinds of things, anything that's up there. But they will mate sometimes in trees. So if you ever see, um, they call them mating balls or see how this guy's kind of all curling up? Imagine three or four snakes curling up like that. And then that's how they do. And then I've actually seen one male competing with another and he literally just goes and pushes another male out of the tree onto the ground if he's trying to compete for that female. So um, they are, like I said, very strong constrictors. They eat mice and rats. Some of them may even eat some very small bunnies or young. Um, and, and of course, they'll go after chicken eggs. So sometimes this one's called a chicken snake because it gets into people's chicken coops and things like that. And so, you know, they like eating chicken eggs. They can swallow that whole, but farmers and, and other people who have chickens for pets or just to grow their own food, they don't really like them. So they do a really nasty trick they'll put in a golf ball and then the snake eats the golf ball and of course this doesn't break down so it can actually end up killing the snake unfortunately. There are other ways to get rid of snakes and help them move on without having to hurt them but um, they have these scales are kind of smooth but the um, belly scale so if you do me a favor and kind of touch your fingernails for me just kind of tap on them that's keratin and that's what your uh, nails are made of, that's what his scales are made of. That's what snake scales are made of. And so the way he's able to climb, besides having strong muscles and just shimmy up a tree, 
because he doesn't have arms or legs is these scales on the bottom and he's really moving um they kind of they lift up he's not helping me okay so he can grip with these belly scales and as he grips he holds on to the pine bark or the bark of the oak tree and he just like it's almost like digging your nails into something and he climbs straight up so um he's excellent at climbing uh they once they get away from you <laughs> they go pretty far um these guys will lay about six to 28 eggs during the middle of the summer and they are fairly heavy bodied i know it's hard to see but he's kind of a thick snake um and again he's very muscular so that kind of makes sense but um again if you see a yellow or a black snake that looks like it can be about eight feet long um it doesn't mean it's a bad snake like i said these eat rats i like snakes a lot more than i like rats because you know rats there that's the problem there so you know or a chicken snake like i said rat snake or chicken snake but this is the adult version so I'm up. Any questions about him before I get the young version of him? I want you to again look at this pattern. So this is the southern coastal area one that's yellow with that black stripe. And then if you look on top, he's got that kind of faint banding. Now I'm going to show you a young one that like the water snake was probably last year's hatchling. So he's about a year old. So I'm going to put him back because he's getting real active. It's always fun putting him back too because you have to look, go in with his head first because if his head pops out, you got to start from scratch. So let me go get the baby. And while Becky gets the uh, baby rat snake, I just want to real quick mention to you guys, I was talking about Eco Explorer and that's sort of um, what we've been talking about for most of the day today. And I just wanted to make sure you guys realize if you haven't signed up for Eco Explorer and you're interested, all you have to do is go to ecoexplore.net with a parent's permission and put in your email and then you can create your own account and you'll be good to go. I just wanna show you what happens when you decide not to put the lid back on the cage right away. <laughs> He's just like, okay, I'm chilling up here. Let me go get him back in or her back in, sorry. <laughs> She was feeling good up there, and I wasn't worried about her. All right. Hey, Ryan, if you would like to send that information to me, I can send it to everybody in our email list as well. Okay, that'd be awesome. And I'll also send you um, a link to, if you're interested in, we'll be doing more classes like this for the month of July. So if anybody's interested in seeing um, another uh, Eco Explorer class, then they're welcome to join. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, so this is the baby rat snake and he's really like facing off with me, as you can see. Um, and sometimes snakes will do this kind of behavior we call a bluff strike, you know, where they're just kind of like big strike at you and you're like, scares you, makes you go back, kind of like the wet smelly farts. Oh, see, he just did it to me. I don't know if you saw it or if I jerked away too quick, but he's, he's, uh, he's trying to bite me. His bite does not hurt. Um, if you've ever been bit by your house cat or play bit by your dog, then it's worse than a snake bite. I promise you that's non-venomous. Um, but this little guy, you can see he's super active. He's like a, he's like a little mini wet noodle, honestly. Um, very curious. If you look at his coloration, you see he's kind of this gray pattern. Um, but look on top. See how he's got that kind of banding that the adult had? But this banding helps him camouflage. So, you know, when you're a baby snake, everything eats you. Birds eat you. Sometimes bullfrogs can eat you. Other snakes eat you. Alligators, raccoons, squirrels, everything you can imagine. You're on the bottom of the food chain. Even some fish for water snakes will eat baby water snakes. So um, this camouflage, when they're not moving, helps them really blend in with like aquatic plants or if they're in the shadows of bushes or hanging out in fields. Look how pretty the belly is. And see, with the adult, it was kind of like, eh, it, had, it had leveled out. And that's also to kind of help them. So they do, rat snakes will do like the bluff strike or whatever, just to try to scare you out in a way. But this little guy, like I said, is just the, the young version. Um, of the adult rat snake there. And he's already grown since I've had him. I feed him two small, what we call pinkies or baby mice with no fur on them um, every two weeks. And he's already, he's getting close to two feet. And when I had him, he was only about a foot. And so when they eat, um, they grow. And as they grow, their skin doesn't fit them anymore. So they have to shed. So I'm gonna show you one of his sheds. 
So once they grow, they shed their skin off. So it's like when you change into your pajamas at night, right? And you take your t-shirt off over your head. That's kind of like what they do. They, they, get, um, they get really dehydrated because they have to push water from their old scales in between their new scales so they can slide out of their shirt. Again, that's, they don't have arms. They can't just be like, well, done with this skin, right? And so when they do that, they also have um, a scale over their eyes that protects their eyes. So snakes don't have eyelids. Like we can blink. Snakes can't blink, right? They don't have eyelids. They have a scale that covers it. And so when they have a really good shed, you can actually make out, here's part of the shed. It's kind of, let me get the other one because you can see the eye. Um, and they have a good shed. Like, so this one was from the corn snake I showed you earlier. Can you clearly see the eye? Yeah, and the mouth. So sorry, the sunlight's kind of varying in here. So um, they shed that. So when a snake is in shed, he's going to look very dull colored. Um, his eyes are going to be cloudy. Like you can't see, he can't see very well. And so of course, you know, it's like when you don't feel good and your little brother is messing with you or something, you're like, leave me alone, leave me alone, right? Don't feel good. So it's like them. They don't because they think they're going to get eaten. And so we tend to leave them alone when they're in shed. But when they come out, they shed through that skin. And then they have this really beautiful, shiny, moist skin. Right. Um, and I know a lot of people think that, oh, snakes, they're slimy. They're no, they're just they're cold blooded. Right. So when we first touch them, they may just feel cold. But if he's just shed, then, you know, he's going to look he's going to feel a little bit wetter just because of his skin. But that they, they go through a lot of water when they are shedding. But you can see him. Like, and this is all just one solid muscle. So they're like a little reptilian belly dancer just moving around. I'm not even, I'm not even moving. He's doing all the work here. So um, the next snake I'm going to show you, the one we're going to um, end on in terms of snakes, um, is a snake that eats other snakes. And so because of that, since I've handled all these snakes, I smell pretty much like a bucket of chicken right now to that next snake. So I'm gonna wash my hands and get them all clean so that I can wash the scent of the other snakes off of me so that he doesn't bite me thinking, oh, good food, hum. You know, I'm not worried about the bite. I just uh, <laughs> I just want to make sure I can handle them and show you without me sitting here going like, okay, let's move this around. So this is a baby rat snake. Any questions on him? Okay, I'm gonna go scrub up. If you do, I promise I'll answer, but let me scrub up so I can get this Eastern King snake out because he's beautiful. Be right back. So while Becky's washing her hands, if you have any questions about any of the snakes you've seen, or if you're just curious about anything Marissa said or about Eco Explore, feel free to type them in the chat and we'll make sure to get your questions answered. This beautiful baby is the Eastern King Snake. Okay, I say baby, it's a full grown adult right here. <laughs> but it is beautiful. Um, the Eastern King Snake, it's called a King Snake because it eats other snakes. So <laughs> that's all a librarian doing her snake. Um, so it has this beautiful black and white kind of. Um, People describe it as like a chain-like or a loop-like pattern that kind of just wraps around it. Um, it's, it's fairly thick um, with that chain-like pattern. Sometimes it could be yellowish looking bars. Um, and you can find king snakes uh, all along the state of North Carolina. And in the Outer Banks, king snakes look a little different. They actually um, are brown instead of black and have light speckles in between the chain light patterns here. So this one, I, it may be a little hard to tell with the lighting in this room, but this is a, is a black Eastern King snake, but it does have a little bit of brown in it. 
And these are extremely strong <laughs> constrictors. Looks like the librarian's dog is getting a, a constrictor too. Um, and so they squeeze their prey. And what they do is, is they put the squeeze on rodents, on eggs, on frogs, uh, lizards, small turtles, uh, salamanders, and other snakes. And guess what? They even eat venomous snakes. That's right, like rattlesnakes and copperheads. So if you see an Eastern king snake in your yard, you are a-okay, all right? And he's protecting, he's getting those copperheads and those rattlesnakes out. In fact, you probably heard that we're supposed to have a big hatching of cicadas this year. Um, and when that happens, be on the lookout for copperheads because they love to eat cicadas right off of the oak trees. And so um, when those come out, they like to snatch up those insects. So uh, king snakes are usually active during the daytime. So typically you can see them when you're out hiking around or they're around farms. Um, they're even sometimes like in neighborhoods. They like to hide under old boards or tins or wood piles, things like that. And remember, usually snakes aren't moving very quickly. They're just kind of sitting in place and, and you know, just kind of slowly moving their way around. There's no rush for them. They don't have to catch the metro or anything. So, you know, when you see one, don't be alarmed. Um, and, and he'll probably move on his own way. But if you're curious and you don't want them right next to your house, any kind of snake, then you should probably move brush piles or any kind of, you know, like just piles of excess things um, away from your house. Uh, you can also make sure that the areas under your porches and things are kind of like closed up with a little bit of a thin chicken wire so they can't get in. How fast can they move? So um, it depends on, on if the snake is going after prey. Um, they, for king snakes, so there are some snakes that are faster, like black racers are extremely fast. They can catch up to you running. Um, whereas a king snake, this is probably something that can, if it's really trying to put a hurt on you, it can move like with quick bursts of speed to get away um, or to go after prey. So I probably say wouldn't, wouldn't probably move unless it's like really trying to boogie faster than you would be if you're walking. But normally what I'm showing on screen is, is the typical like da -dum, da -dum, kind of speed of snakes here. And king snakes will actually, this, uh, they get to be about seven feet long. Um, but they average close to three and a half to four feet long. I think I saw a question in there about that. So, um, you know, they, they live in all kinds of habitats, but um, they also are found near water oftentimes. So, you know, that's some, somewhere else to look for them. So they're not really, don't confuse them with a water snake, but you sometimes may find them by water. And they'll lay 10 to 24 eggs in the summer, and then the babies come out August or September. So, you know, start looking for that uh, when it's about time to come back to school. And when they're born, the babies look like the adults. So, you know, with the rat snake, it looked a little different than the adult. The baby king snakes look like adult king snakes there. <laughs> yeah, they are noodles, aren't they? <laughs> um, but they are, again, immune to the venom of pit vipers like cottonmouths, copperheads, and rattlesnakes. And you can see this guy right here, even though he's a king snake, he must know it because he's like, I'm cool, man. Nothing bothers me. He's so chill. Um, his, he's very heavy bodied again, because he's a strong constrictor, but his scales are very smooth. Um, one thing to look for in snakes too that you might see is on this little guy, and I'm not saying it is one, but sometimes they get uh, injuries when they're going after something. So I'm not sure if you can see this kind of bubble right here on him. So sometimes snakes being constrictors, you know, if you really tighten and overuse a muscle, you can develop hernias. Um, and so some snakes get hernias and then they just either naturally have to heal from them um, or, you know, they get injured when they're going after prey sometimes too. And even ticks and mites can get up underneath their scales. Um, and so that's another reason that if you see a snake in the wild, we just kind of want to watch it with our eyes because, you know, they, they're wild animals, so they've got all kinds of things going on. And another reason I like to wash my hands between uh, after handling snakes and things is because like any reptile, um, you know, you could get salmonella by touching them, you know. Um, it's not like, you know, they're going in and using their hand sanitizer or anything like that. So it's always good to wash your hands after handling any snakes at all. But um, the Eastern king snake, like I said, it'll eat rattlesnakes. So hopefully it doesn't get excited about this. But since we're on the subject of rattlesnakes, um, if you've ever seen a rattle or if you find them out in the wild, a lot of people believe you can age a rattlesnake by the number of rattles. 
but I'm here to tell you today that's just not true. So as we said before, as a snake grows, he sheds. And each time the rattlesnake sheds, he gets a new rattle. So you're thinking, okay, yeah, but it depends on how many times a year that rattlesnake eats. And another thing is that um, when a rattlesnake shakes this thing, and I'm gonna see if the king snake responds to this at all. Um, kind of hoping he doesn't. <laughs> but when I shake it like, oh, yeah, you think about it. When I shake it like this, I can't move it near as fast as a rattlesnake can. But what you don't see is these little scales, there's just space in between. So there's nothing in them. It's, it's like an empty maraca. Okay. It's like an empty maraca there. So, you know, when I'm shaking, um, it's just the scales rubbing on the scales. And of course, a rattlesnake is very powerful. So it can shake it much, much faster. Um, but <laughs> he's going all over the place there. But when he shakes it, sometimes he might be near a rock or something hard. And when he hits it, the rattles can bust off. So um, you may not always have the full number of rattles that are there. And then if you've ever gone to the doctor or had a shot or donated blood, um, that same needle uh, with the little bevel or the little hole in the middle um, is pretty similar to and probably uh, adapted from a venomous snake tooth. So I have a snake tooth in my hand. I'm hoping that that comes into focus and I'm going to rotate it. And I'm not sure if the camera is going to pick up on it, but there's a little beveled edge right in there. So a little hole. So snake teeth aren't like straws, you know, where you just like suck up moisture through a straw. Um, it's actually kind of like a needle, like when you get a shot at the doctor's office. And so that's how they inject venom. So a lot of people seem to think that young or baby venomous snakes are actually um, more dangerous than um, adult venomous snakes. And that's just not true. So, you know, you can only make as much venom as, as the, the size of the prey that you're going after. And young snakes can't make as much venom as adult snakes. Um, you know, and as far as them not having as much control over it, uh, you know, I mean, it, we don't really know that. So, but, um, but when it comes to king snakes, it doesn't matter either way because they can eat them and they're totally immune to the venom. So it doesn't bother them at all. But you can find these all around the state, except for probably the very most upper regions of the mountains. Um, but king snakes are fantastic and they're just beautiful creatures. And uh, I hope I, sorry, I, I know I kind of rambled a little bit, but there's just so much to talk about with snakes. Another thing you might notice that when I change my voice or I go really loud, let me show you some, let's see if he responds to loud noises or anything. Boom! You didn't even care. So snakes, they don't have ears. So you don't have to worry about that. No, no outer ear openings. So when people say, oh, walk in the woods, make as much noise as possible to scare those snakes. I mean, you can do it for yourself. You might scare some other things like bears and other animals, but really just take a big stick and move it in front of you because if a snake feels the brush moving, he's gonna move away from it to try to avoid. So most snakes are just trying to avoid a confrontation, not look for one. So just uh, right now, this time of year, just be cautious of where you're watching. Always look before you step and have something you can kind of shake the brush up in front of you beforehand, too. So any, any questions, Ryan, or anything people want to know? And you can see how, like, this one's just balling up on itself. I'm not being a very good tree. So he's like, I'm trying to support myself. He's cuddling himself. So. Whoa. Hey, Becky. Yeah. Um, is, um... So the king snake, and you said it was immune to the poison because it can eat the venomous snakes. If mm -hmm. it were to get bit by a venomous snake, would it have any effect on the snake? Nope. So that's why they're immune because chances are while he's trying to eat it, because he's constricting it, right? So as that snake is trying to fight back, he's going to try to bite him and inject venom, but it doesn't affect him at all. And you know, possums are also immune to copperhead um, and uh, they're, they're, they're immune to venom for some of our young pit vipers as well. So even possums uh, are, are immune, which is pretty neat. One cool thing about snakes I don't think that I mentioned is, um, you know, they have a very special ability, like some mammals, for instance, um, that, you know, sometimes people will have snakes in captivity and they'll have them for like a year and then all of a sudden they lay eggs and they're like, what? Well, I haven't had another snake in this enclosure for over a year. What's going on? So um, they can mate and then save um, the sperm and then choose to fertilize the eggs later. And when I say choose, I mean, basically they want to make sure that they're not stressed out. That there's plenty of water, um, you know, that, that the environmental conditions are favorable. And that's just an adaptation that a lot of animals have developed over time in order to help increase their survival, but also increase the survival of their offspring. 
And then sometimes they'll just lay eggs, kind of like turtles that are like spacer eggs. There's just nothing in them. They just, you know, lay in them. Boy, he's, he's curious about all you. Some of them smell really good over there. <laughs> Any other questions? Anything else in the chat? Uh, we'll give people a few minutes um, to type them in the chat if they have any, but I'm not seeing any right now. Okay, I can go grab my toad if you want. She's usually pretty active. Yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at Roxy. Okay, We're I'm gonna put this approaching thing. one hour, but um, as long as people are interested, we'll uh, let Becky show <laughs> us one more of her, uh, her many reptiles and amphibians. We're going to finish out with her toad, Roxy, the superstar. Yeah, <laughs> she is. Hey, um, while Becky's getting Roxy, I'm still looking. I almost caught a lizard, guys, but lizards are very fast. Um, but I just, just want to share it. Ryan, can you guys see me okay? Yep. Yes. Okay, I just want to show you. Um, it's hot out, and I'm getting eaten up by mosquitoes and flies, but sometimes walking in the woods is definitely worth it. I just wanted to show you guys my view here at the Curry Tuck Banks Reserve out here on the sound. I'm looking for tree frogs on the reeds of the marsh or maybe a snake in the water here. I haven't seen anything yet, but there's plenty of wildlife to definitely take pictures of. So just by walking at a local trail, you can definitely probably get tons of observations. But I'm gonna keep looking as you guys talk about Roxy, but if not, um, I'll probably check in again before I leave. But I was hoping to find some more cool things for you guys today, but at least I found a tree frog. And um, thanks so much for joining us, guys. I appreciate it and hope this encourages you guys to get outside. Thanks, Marissa. Yeah, um, like she said, it's real hot out here today. And um, being at about 11 o'clock, it might be sort of the rest time for a lot of these, these herps. So like we were talking about earlier, the best times are to go right after a rain or during the cool times of the summer, like uh, during sunrise or right after sunset. Yeah, that's very true. Um, even though they are warm-blooded, or I mean cold-blooded, they uh, they still, they're smart. They don't want to be out with their obvious food. So uh, this is a very, very, very healthy um, southern toad. She just muted me. My own toad muted me. I can't believe it. That's rude. So Roxy over here is what I named her. She's a southern toad. She's uh, very Ah, uh, she's peeing on my keyboard. My IT guy's gonna love me with my laptop. Um, so um, yes, as frogs, they pee as a defense mechanism. You might notice a trend here, right? It's just gross. So um, she, uh, she peed on me to let me know that she's afraid of me and she doesn't like this one bit, but she's a Southern toad. And um, you find these in your yard all over the state. Um, well, I should, I say all over the state. I should double check that really quickly because I'm used to living <laughs> Um, actually out here in the coastal area. So, but, um, but southern toads are, they kind of have just a, a, a really kind of whiny call. You'll hear them at night. It almost sounds like a cricket that's, that's mad about something. They have these, let me see, should, let me show you her feet. She's peeing all over my keyboard. Um, got these gnarly looking feet right here. Um, when a toad jumps, so toads, you do find them near water. But they're totally terrestrial, so they're all, always on land for the most part. Um, and they have this distinct hop. I always think of them as like a little bodybuilder because when they, they almost look like they, you know, they did arm day, but they forgot to do the legs. And then all of a sudden they hop and they just kind of hop like straight up, whereas frogs are like, Pew, goodbye. Um, and so there's these stout little muscle builders here. And one cool thing about her you can see is her underbelly is kind of clearish, a little bit of spotting right there. But on her back, um, you notice she's got a little bit of a pattern. And they have these glands right here. The I'm trying to make sure you can see it. Parotenoid glands. And right, this is her eye right here. Behind that, there's a little ridge. And then there's these glands. And uh, she's not doing it just yet. But if you've ever seen a dog pick up a toad and then start like, come back here, foaming at the mouth. Um, it's because these glands will actually excrete a toxin and it comes out like a milky white kind of sap color. And so um, that toxin is, is basically to sour the taste for any animal that's trying to eat it. 
Um, and then that way, hopefully it'll make them sick and they're like, oh, I don't want to eat that anymore. But these guys, again, they'll hang out in yards. <laughs> um, so you can find them anywhere. Um, and Roxy, I think she's at least a couple years old and toads only live, you know, maybe, maybe up to five years, much less in the wild. But this is, this is a southern toad right here. Let me just double check. Yes, yeah, so um, the range of the southern toad is going to yeah. be, um, or it might not go west of Raleigh. So it's all in the okay. eastern and southern part of the state. And then west of that, you're going to see the American toad. <laughs> gotcha. So, but yeah, so this is a little toad I got right here. So she's pretty hardy. She gets fed, she gets crickets today. So she, I know she's excited. It's a special day for her. She's a big girl. Yeah, she's getting a little too many crickets. Yeah, don't tell her that. Hey, get that girl. <laughs> she's about to find another home. Like, I go get crickets. Um, any questions about toads? How long, how long does she grow? So she is fully grown. She's just widening out now. Hey, get back here. Whoops. I hope she didn't knock me off of Zoom. <laughs> so this is, <clears throat> so when I say fully grown, um, using my pointer finger is about the whole length of her. And look, she's actually producing some of that toxin. So they do that sometimes when they're stressed. See that kind of milky? And um, what, another fun thing about southern toads is, is that when the males want to mate, they jump on the back of the female and they actually, males will have like an extra toe on them. This is a female, but a male will have an extra toe, they call it clasper toe. And they like grab on from behind, but they can't tell if it's a male or a female. And so they'll just kind of grab on and then all of a sudden southern toads will just make this noise kind of like, hey, hey, I'm, I'm a dude, get off, get off, right? So they just jump on one and be like, are you my friend? Are you my friend? No, okay, okay. So they just kind of back off. But this, uh, whew, she's all over the place. She's starting to invite new people to Zoom. So that's Roxy, that's the Southern Toad. And she does have kind of warty she's skin. <laughs> she's on the go. She has warty skin, um, but not all toads have warty skin, just like not all frogs have smooth skin, so. Um, is all anyway, we'll put her back because she's very active right now. And uh, thank you so much for showing us the snakes. And then Roxy is always a delight to see. She was super active today. Um, so thank, thank you for all that, Becky. That was awesome to see. If anybody has any uh, last minute questions, we'll stick around. You can type them in the chat. But if not, um, I'll send the information to Miss Destiny Williams and she'll send it out to you guys for Eco Explorer. But we thank you guys so much for joining us today. And we hope you have a good rest of your day. Yeah. Thank you so much to Ryan, Becky, Roxy, and her snakes. And thank you so much to Marissa out in the wild. Uh, we saw a lot of really interesting things. We learned a lot of really great things. And I just would like to get some announcements out before we end this program, OK? So once again, thank you guys to everybody, the Eco Explorers in this program. I'd like to remind everybody that we have follow-up kits. This is what they look like this week, and it includes a scavenger hunt to help start your Eco Explore. Next week, um, and then on Wednesday, we will have story time posted at 11. Next week, we have sock puppets with Miss Susan Swain, and the kit next week will be sock puppets. And then we will also have the dinosaur program from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, just like we had last week. That will be on the 9th of July. Does anybody else have any questions? All right. Well, thank you guys so much. And we have kits ready for everybody, OK? All right. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you, Becky. Have a good day, you guys. See you soon. <laughs>